Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, um, I think probably most do actually, but for those of you that don't know me, my name is uh, Tom Barnes and uh, uh, it's my privilege actually to be Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research Enterprise here uh, at the University of Greenwich. And it's my great pleasure to offer you the warmest of welcomes uh, to tonight's inaugural lecture by Professor Ben Bennett. Uh, there are many interesting and pleasurable things about the job that I do. And uh, one of the highlights on the interest and pleasure scale has been to see the way in which the Natural Resources Institute has developed over the past eight years. Following the untime of government funding for development work in around about the late 90s, um, the Institute entered some pretty parlous times, as I think many of you know. Uh, there was a substantial reduction in size, uh, there was great uncertainty um, about the future of the Institute. But in recent times, uh, particularly in the past, past five years, uh, the Institute has been able to put that well behind it on the back of a great deal of effort. Uh, and. Uh, some very impressive uh, successes in reputation building here and abroad and in funding have seen it become one of the jewels in the crown of the University of Greenwich. Uh, very roughly half of all of our external research funding is gained via the Institute. And through its work, our researchers have benefited the lives of literally millions of people worldwide and created an international reputation for our work in agriculture and development that far outstrips that of similar universities nationwide. And Ben has made a pivotal contribution to that recovery. He's been with the Institute for 24 years, through bad times and good. During that time, he's undertaken extensive tours of duty abroad for the Institute as a policy advisor to local governments, for example, and in addition, he's done huge amounts of overseas consulting work. And through that work, he has created for himself an extraordinary international reputation as a trade economist, which combines a superb understanding of research uh, with finely honed skills in applying the very latest research results in a very pragmatic way to achieve rapid benefits for the countries where he's working. And he applies those skills not just to his personal research and enterprise work in the Institute, but also to leading the Food and Markets Department in the Institute, which in recent years has been one of the most successful, in fact the most successful department in the Institute in terms of external contracting, and it's a potent contributor to the profile of both the Institute and the University on the international stage. Uh, ben has always had an interest in the marketing of wild harvested natural products and the relationship between markets and conservation of natural resources. And that, in part, explains the rather interesting title of tonight's lecture. Um, I first got to know Ben's work through his interests in myrrh, uh, through his interest in the multitude of uses for and the benefits of uh, the, that most interesting of trees, the upside down tree or the baobab, and the possibilities of using the devil's claw, which by the way uh, is not something uh, from Frankie Goes to Hollywood, but is a, Nib a Namibian plant with medicinal properties, as I'm sure many of you know, for economic benefit in uh, developing countries. Uh, despite his support for Manchester United, all this is not to say that Ben is some kind of off-piste, new age purveyor of substances that have been interwoven in religious law, in the practice and promotion of folk remedies for well-being, and in football for up to 20 centuries now. No, Ben is a clever, hard-working, hard-headed economist who commands huge respect both within this university and in the national and international communities. We are fortunate to have him working with us, and so it's my great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce you, Professor Ben Bennett. Thank you, Tom. That, that's a hard act to follow. I feel I should leave now, because it really won't get much, uh, much better than that. Thank you, Tom. I'm sorry. 
very kind. Um, I, I have a few um, uh, health and safety announcements before we uh, start. Uh, at some point during this lecture, uh, there might be a possibility of a certain amount of, uh, of smoke. Uh, the fire alarms have been turned off, so if I shall leave, it means we've all got to leave. If you have um, eye problems or respiratory problems, I won't mind if you start coughing and, and walk out. Uh, if you're a Manchester City fan and feel you need to leave now, <laughs> that's also fine. Perfectly okay with with me. So let's get it out of, out of the way right at the beginning. Uh, I am a Manchester United fan and there's nothing that I can do about that or would ever want to do about that. Um, and the reason I've got Manchester United uh, in here is because of the gift that this has given me uh, with many years of development practice in, in some really quite uh, challenging environments and, and uh, difficult countries. So Manchester United has many times literally saved my life from the taxi driver who turned out to uh, love the new Mexican import that we had bought, bought and therefore decided to slow down and not, uh, and not kill me, uh, to the individual farmer and farmer's wife who decided, yes, they would give me an interview because they love David Beckham. <laughs> Don't we all? So this, in a way, is an homage to Manchester United and it kind of, it kind of ends there because it's been, what it's done is given me an opportunity to communicate with people in a different way over many years in different cult cultures and different languages in different countries. I don't know whether there's any um, Liverpool fans um, in the house tonight. Anyone want to admit it? <laughs> yeah, my eldest brother, of course. Yes. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so how do you feel about last season? How did it go for you? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to talk about it. <laughs> well, though I understand that and your position, I wouldn't want to talk about it either, but the point is it's a point of contact. And, and, and in the type of work that I've done in the developing world, a point of contact is a really valuable Thing, and I've used, uh, used this unmercifully over the, over the years. And the kind of my starting point uh, for this lecture um, uh, is the early days that, uh, when I lived in, in Nigeria and I ran a football team. And believe it or not, yes, that adorable character on the left hand side, that's, that's me with hair, fantastic, isn't it? I, I know there's a tradition with professorial lectures of having a really early picture. Well, uh, um, I, I, I'm, I'm I think I can be forgiven for dragging this one out from the back of the catalogue. Um, this was Pandagara United uh, on their fantastic tour of uh, northern Namibia, uh, very successful, victorious team. As you see, many of them um, are not looking at my rather poor camera, um, and that's because they truly believe that if I took their photograph, their energy and spirit would be taken. And that, uh, that belief still holds true today when you go to Nigeria. Uh, being there recently, you take people's pictures, you have to ask permission because they're concerned that you might, uh, might take part of them away with you. Our goalkeeper, who was fantastic, um, would not look at the camera. So today, um, I'm going to work my way through uh, a few examples of uh, some of the practice and some of the lessons that I've uh, learned the hard way uh, during many years with uh, NRI and, and during my previous career. And I'm going to focus this talk um, on, on how we feed ourselves, how we solve some of the big problems um, in, in the world. Um, NRI is involved in, in science, I'm interested in marketing and economics, uh, so I'm going to talk about how those two things uh, blend together and, and work towards a greater goal with some practical examples. I'm interested in commodities, I'm interested in some weird commodities and their challenges and they're quite fun, so I'll talk a little bit about that with some hopefully extreme examples already heard about them, then just put your hand up, we'll skip on to another one. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about global market access. It, it's in the title of uh, my, my professorship. I've done a lot of work in international trade. I could spend an entire week talking about work in international trade, so we might gloss over that quite quickly. Um, as Tom uh, very kindly said, I have a particular interest in novel natural products, so we'll, we'll end up with some lessons from natural products and I'll say a few things about what, what I've learned and, and where I see the future uh, and the exciting things that might happen in, in the coming years in the sector that I've, been, uh, that I've been working. We'll try and look a little bit over the horizon. Um, so as uh, many of you know, I'm sure, and are fully engaged with the uh, marketing plan of the university, um, the university is sponsoring Charlton Athletic. I'm not holding this against the Vice-Chancellor, I think that's a really good idea. Um, but we're not going to be talking about 
Charles Blast. I think we're going to be talking about Manchester United. So we just be absolutely <laughs> We're not talking about Charlton, we are talking about Manchester United. So now we've got that out of the way, sorry Vice Charles, that's the way it is. Um, this, this space is mine for the next hour at least. Um, before I came to NRI, um, I worked for what was ODA and is now DFID, Department for International Development, as a young civil servant, a young economist. Um, and I was very influenced by this gentleman. Uh, so th this, is, this is Robert Chambers. Um, and I found myself in a very junior position on a Friday afternoon, and I have to say in those days, Friday afternoons uh, in the civil service, um, people had had a very substantial liquid lunch, uh, on the top floor of Stag Place, uh, and they used to do talks, and they invite the great and the good, and the clever and the, and the wise to come in and give a chat. Uh, so they invited Robert in to give a chat, um, but all of the economists were drunk. So what he did was he put up a map of the world upside down, and uh, this rather shallow and facile um, uh, message that he was trying to give to the senior civil servants that were in the room was received very badly. Um, so he berated them. He told them, you need to get out of your Land Rovers. You need to go and talk to the people in the fields. Um, you should not be like the World Bank. You should be better than that. And as you can imagine, it went down like a lead balloon. And many of them left, actually. But those of the younger economists amongst us were very affected. By this, this concept of participation, of rural-based uh, work, of bottom-up development, um, it, it struck a chord uh, with us. And it's kind of much of the work that I've done over the years. And I, I've been working in this evolving field of, of marketing economics, and particularly development studies and market economics. And, and there have been exciting times. In the last 30 years, we've gone from a, a place where many developing countries had a Marxist model, with state intervention, and big centralized stores, and single prices across the country. We've moved on from that Marxist model to the Washington Consensus, where the World Bank forced uh, all of these countries to comply with the, uh, the new monetarist rules, um, uh, and insisted that they get rid of all of this marketing infrastructure. So I've been heavily involved in that. And we started to see some of these bottom-up and participatory approaches uh, begin to emerge. Uh, and more recently, uh, we've got a whole new genre of, uh, uh, of new ideas and fresh ideas coming up with livelihoods and concepts of social capital, value chain analysis, um, dealing with global inequality and measuring it in new and exciting ways and, and seeing through th things through the lenses of value chains and the concepts of governance and, and balance. So this, this is an exciting time. I feel I'm, I'm, uh, I'm coming towards the conclusion of really quite an exciting intellectual journey over these last 30 years. So one of the key questions that people like me ask is, why don't markets work? The theory is that markets should, in, should price should intermediate, intermediate supply and demand. And in most countries, most developing countries, this fails. And it fails because there aren't any roads. There's no banks. There's no electricity. So transaction costs are very high. It fails because not everybody knows everything. So you know, if you want to buy something, buy a new car, you can go and research it online. Most people can't. Um, it fails because you can't get all of those economic benefits that normally happen in economies like scale economies. You can't grow. You can't upgrade. And for lots of other reasons, but those are three of the key ones. So over the years, these are the sorts of, um, of questions that people like me have, have been asking to try to interrogate this concept of, of market failures uh, in agriculture in, develop, in the developing world. So a few words of background about where we've come from and where we are and the sorts of challenges and problems that, that the world's agricultural economy faces. Um, because you know, here I sit, or, and here my department sits, between global food supply and global Food, de food demand. So what does this really mean um, in numbers? Well, the world's got a few challenges, and the news isn't particularly good. Um, the best projections are that we're going to have to find enough food to feed an additional 9 billion people in the next 50 years, and that's a massive challenge. Uh, we know that food prices are rising um, consistently, have risen consistently over the last 50 years, will continue uh, to rise, so food will get more expensive. Now may be a good time to invest in cargo, just a thought. Um, we're becoming increasingly urbanized. The world became more urban than rural a few years ago. Africa will become more urban than rural in a few years' time. 
so the, the number of people living in the countryside that are feeding those, uh, those urban areas, that dynamic is, is changing very quickly. And our eating habits are changing. So we've been doing quite a lot of work on that. People, as they get wealthier, they switch from pulses and cheap food, and they move into meat and meat-based products. And that affects the way that the rural economy works. We know that climate change is going to affect, uh, affect yields. Uh, and, and in this graph, you can, you can see the likelihood that uncertain weather will have a yield uh, impact in, in Africa and the number of times it's likely to happen. So there will be lots more crop failures. Um, there is a biofuels bonanza going on. So um, lots of farmers in the future will switch to producing fuel instead of producing food. And that's going to squeeze the amount of food available as well. I put that circle kind of badly, that oval badly there because it's over cassava. And the cassava number is really big and, and we at NRI are really interested uh, in cassava. Um, more bad news, I guess, that water is going to become scarcer, largely because we're urbanizing and because some of the bigger countries in the world are growing and industrializing very quickly. So you can see the BRICS number is moving, uh, going to move up by 2050 quite a lot. So we need water to grow more food um, and uh, water is going to become more scarce. There is some good news. We're doing really well on reducing the prevalence of hunger, hunger and undernourishment, which is, which is great. And extreme poverty is going, out, going down, mainly because some of the really big countries are, are becoming semi-industrialized. Um, and child stunting is declining. Star child stunting is a really interesting, um, a, a really useful uh, indicator of future nutrition problems. Unfortunately, <coughs> Africa is not doing very well on this figure. Um, so that's something we need to do better. Nutrition is, is going to be a, a very important issue. So that gives you a kind of basis of, of uh, perhaps the bad news or where the world uh, world is. I, I want to talk a little bit now um, about the practical problems of markets uh, and, and, and how some of the work that I've done has tried to address some of these food supply um, and food demand issues. So the, there's practical problems with markets, their measurements and resolution, bringing economics to bear, matching science with social science. Um, and uh, finally, a bit of fun, market the, marking, marketing the impossible. Uh, I've had to try to market a few difficult things over the years, so I'll share a few of those with you. So the first area of practice that I want to talk about um, is post-harvest losses. Uh, and NRI has um, an enviable reputation going over many years for its work in, in identifying and reducing post-harvest losses. If we're going to increase food availability and reuse our resources, better. There's a limited number of, of levers that we can pull to make this work. We can intensify agriculture, like mechanization and fertilization, improve seeds, irrigation, all those good things. So we can work on the, on the efficiency of production uh, and yield side. Um, but a lot of that's, a lot of the low hanging fruit have already been captured there. Um, we can try and bring more land um, into use. We can have land reform, land reclamation, use land more, more, more efficiently, um, uh, bring some water to bear if we can. But the only other moving part really um, is to stop us producing food that then gets spoiled or wasted. It's really important because we put energy into making food and inputs, we use water for it which is becoming scarcer. Um, if we waste it, if we, if we lose it, we don't have all of that nutrition so there's an nutritional cost and, and therefore um, a disbenefit to, uh, to health. So this is a summary of, um, uh, it's the front page of the website that we've recently um, launched uh, for the Post Harvest Centre uh, at the Natural Resources Institute uh, and we have some promotional materials. So uh, Tom, I've got an early um, uh, retirement gift for now. <laughs> where, where are we? <laughs> We have um, quite bravely, I think, tried to estimate what the real scale is and what the real value is of post-harvest losses in Africa. And the number's alarmingly large. So this massive red dot on the right-hand side is um, the value of losses in a year uh, for cereals, uh, fish, fruit and veg, meat, milk, and roots and tubers. $48 billion is a really massive figure. You very quickly come to a very large figure indeed when you start to do this sort of work. Um, 
that's only a starting point. Aggregating numbers is always risky and dangerous, but if you know what the figure is, at least then you can start to adjust the policies to try to, try to address it. So how do we try to address this at NRI? We start with trying to identify and measure the losses, um, and that's actually much harder than you think. Um, they're not easy to see. If you aggregate them, you start to get into silly numbers very fast. It's very dangerous. Um, so actually, people often avoid the problem of measuring and identifying where they are because it's expensive and they don't like the result. Then you try and encourage people with um, you know, new practices and new ways um, to manage their agriculture and their agricultural markets in a way that minimizes, and to organize themselves in a way that minimizes losses. Um, this next bubble um, is usually the one that people start with because they find they've got a fantastic technical solution and then they want to retrofit the technical solution and make sure the economics and the social part work. So we've got, you know, we've got a great new store, let's, uh, let's put the stores out and we'll worry about the economics of it later. Well, it, it actually works the other way around. Um, you really should understand the, the socioeconomics of, of your technical intervention fully before you actually go out there and launch it and expect people to take it up. So technical innovations are a really important element of this, but they're only one element of, of the whole thing. Um, and finally, you need, a, you need the right policies environment. And I think we're getting much better at nuancing incentives and having clever incentive structures that, that encourage farmers to do the right behavior um, in, instead of doing behavior that has cost to them and external cost to the rest of the economy. So a few examples of, of post-harvest losses work that I've done with NRI over the years. These lovely ladies, and uh, thank you, John, for the uh, photograph uh, yesterday. These lovely ladies are, um, are from uh, southern India. Um, we did some value chain analysis. We looked at the markets for fish in southern India. We talked to the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of women fish traders and asked them what their problems were. And they said to us, well, we have to use these hand-woven baskets. And when, when we tried to get on buses, the bus drivers won't let us on because all of this horrible fish pours through the bottom. And that was a time when they were just introducing spun aluminium in, in southern India. Um, and our colleague, uh, Tim Bostock, I'm sure many of you know, um, came up with the brilliant idea of working with these women to design this, this new fish basket, the modern fish basket. Um, I think they managed to move over 200,000 of them um, and made a real difference to these women's lives. It was the right shape to carry, it was very light, and it fitted exactly into the slot in the top of a bus. <laughs> um, there are huge losses in the grain sector in Africa and recent outbreaks of, of pests in the decades that I've been working here, the large grain borer particularly, and this is an example of large grain borer damage. Um, people store their food, hope to come back to it later, open the store, it's all been eaten. And that's a catastrophe. <laughs> Um, NRI has done some fantastic work on how to measure post-harvest losses, losses in stores over the years and how to manage those uh, pests. Um, and, and particularly, we've developed a system called the African Post-Harvest Loss Information System, um, which allows policymakers to uh, assess whether there might be a disastrous post-harvest loss on the horizon. Um, and I, I'm very happy to say that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, are, are now committed to, uh, to, to growing AFLIS to AFLIS Plus and taking on all sorts of other commodities as well by the, by the end of this year. So that's been one of our, our real success stories. Um, I've done quite a lot of work on livestock marketing and transboundary uh, diseases. Um, it's uh, surprisingly difficult to move um, a piece of meat from one country to another. Um, and the main reason why it's difficult is because vets really don't want you to do it. Um, so, uh, ironically today I've just received an email from somebody at the, uh, from OIE and they've agreed, uh, we've been working on something called commodity based trade to allow, uh, instead of the area being free of foot and mouth, the animal can be the thing that's free of foot and mouth. And they've agreed to a change in the rules last week uh, so that, that that's, now, that's now going to be implemented, which opens up the possibility of instead of having uh, transboundary free zones, you can have transboundary free animals. Could make a big difference um, in, in um, the surplus cattle producing areas of the world which didn't have market access before. Uh, and I couldn't talk about uh, post harvest losses without talking about cassava. My family are tired of hearing about cassava. 
They love cassava to pieces, but uh, they've heard, they know more about cassava than I do, I think. Um, cassava is highly perishable. Uh, 48 hours, it's starting to go really bad. So dealing with that waste and that loss is very important for a very large number of people. And, and the numbers involved in cassava are huge. We're talking millions of farmers over a vast area. <coughs> so, how big are post-harvest losses? Well, you've seen my big figure at the beginning. Um, traditionally, uh, everybody talks about a 30% post-harvest loss. And I've discovered who it was who started the 30% loss story. It was Henry Kissinger. Who would believe it? Um, I thought he was trying to fix things in the Middle East and, and, and encourage detente. It turns out he made a presentation at the World Food Congress in 1974 and announced that 30% of all food is lost post-harvest. And those of us that have worked in this field know that that figure has persisted. Even to this day, I go to international meetings and people say, oh, 30% is lost. The reality is quite different, quite nuanced. There are high losses, but it's not just, it's not just the scale of the losses, it's the location of the losses that, that matter. Um, and it's, it's the way that those losses occur. Physical losses are one thing, economic losses are another. So physical loss is when something deteriorates, but it's still usable in some way. So you lose the weight of that product, if you like. And economic loss is when you have to sell that product for its next best use. So those two different things, very hard to measure, very hard to understand at scale. And we found, we've been finding with some of our work recently that the location of the loss in the value chain really makes an enormous difference to the total value of that loss. So to illustrate that, um, we've just finished a piece of work for the European Union in Ghana, Nigeria, Thailand and Vietnam, looking at the cassava value chain and locating where the losses, economic uh, and physical losses in the cassava value chain are. Um, and I won't bore you with all the details, um, but this graph shows you that in these four countries, Ghana, it turns out, has got the biggest losses. And those losses are occurring in the distribution, retail, and consumption end. And that's because people in Ghana uh, like to have fresh cassava. They don't process it, they want to eat it, eat it fresh. So their losses are absolutely <coughs> massive, and they're right at that end of the value chain. Thailand, on the other hand, is completely mechanized. So they have surprisingly high losses, but it's because they're leaving stuff in the field which they didn't realize that was being left, left behind and, and we're now doing, some, doing an intervention associated with that. So when you turn that into money, you can see that the physical losses and the economic <coughs> losses put together, because it's far down the value chain, completely outsway the losses that you find in, in other countries. So that illustrates nicely the, 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 the importance of location in post-harvest loss research. Um, and actually, uh, that 30% figure, some of those countries, Vietnam for example, well below 30%. Actually, usually people have strategies to deal with post-harvest problems, so 30% as a blanket figure can be quite dangerous. Um, if you summarise all this work we've been doing in these four countries, we then come up with innovations and solutions, and I put this slide up just to demonstrate the value of some of those solutions. When you can find beneficial uses of wastes and losses, the numbers get quite big quite fast, and in this case, um, we've just recently calculated the, the benefit um, from these four countries from, from the partial uptake of some of these new technologies and, and it reaches quite a big figure quite quickly and it's an interesting economic figure um, and, and certainly wor worth investing uh, in. So what are the key findings from this um, area of practice? Um, Getting real and meaningful measurements is more complicated than it would seem. You can't just go out there and weigh stuff and say we've lost 10%, we've lost 30%. It's, it's far more complicated than that. Um, I think we've also learned that you can't persuade people to change their practices and traditions and way of doing things by heavily regulating them. It's always the go-to thing that when you talk to policymakers in developing countries, they say, let's start a law. No bad cassava, we'll arrest anybody that makes some bad cassava. It simply doesn't work. Um, there's enormous promise for new techn technologies in the post-harvest losses area in terms of measuring and identifying and warning people and coming up with new, new solutions, new exciting ways of beneficiating post-harvest losses. Uh, and I think there's, uh, you know, that's one of the great new horizons of post-harvest losses. Um, and, and it sounds banal, but actually turning losses and waste into products that have value and therefore affect the bottom line uh, of small enterprises um, 
people often simply don't think about it. They just don't work through the economics of doing that. And, and we, can, we can show through some of our work that it's a real, it's a win-win. So I want to move now on to um, some of the work I've done on the more uh, productivity side of uh, agricultural marketing. Um, I'm sure everybody's heard of Norman Borlaug and is aware of the, uh, the first green revolution. Um, my wife told me I have to tell people what lodging is because not everybody knows what lodging is. So what, what Borlaug managed to do, managed to do through um, traditional um, uh, selection of seeds and trays um, is to solve the problem of wheat that falls over. Um, and when it falls over, it's, it rots and it can't be picked up by the combine harvester and you lose yield. So when you walk in the fields full of wheat in this country and it's nice and short, that's because these are, these are new short varieties that don't lodge. Um, and you can see from this graph what a massive impact this, this, new te this breeding technology has had on, on productivity. You know, we're, we're feeding the world and we're keeping prices of wheat down by this amazing thing that, that Norman gift that Norman Borlaug gave to us. We're on the verge of a second green revolution and I'm enormously excited by by the possibilities of, of what can happen with genetic technologies. I, I, I'm not amongst those people that, that is frightened of them and is, is uh, afraid of, of uh, uh, the damage that it might do to me if I eat a, a GMO. I, I, I think there's, some, there's, there's a lot of uh, um, ill-advised press on this particular subject. Um, and, 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 and I think it's very unbalanced, this story as well. So I want to show you a little film um, from, from Erie. I, I was asked uh, to evaluate, I was on a team that um, evaluated um, a new variety of uh, rice at Erie that had high yield but also uh, resisted flooding. So rice floods, um, it's normal for rice to flood, uh, but the problem is when it floods, it stops respirating and it stops producing, so you get a lower yield. If you can turn the plant off, switch it off when it floods, and then switch it on when the water recedes, there's a magic result. So here they are, they planted the seed, the new seeds on the left hand side, the old ones on the right. It starts to emerge after the flood and there's a dramatic difference. I, 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 find, this, I find this film really inspirational, I think everybody should see it. So we get up to about day 90 and it's already fruiting on the left hand side, but some seeds coming. The one on the right's catching up a little bit. But the net result, fantastic. Look at that, three times the yield. That's a magic bit of science. That's a magic bit of science and a wonderful public good and good, good to the world and, and fantastic work and I, you know, I really I think we should communicate this, uh, this sort of benefit of the, of the coming Green Revolution a lot more. Um, I, I, to, to perhaps to balance that up a bit, I've got a few examples of, of uh, work that I've done with scientists where the scientists have kind of misunderstood the point. So my first example is, is, is sesame. Um, we were invited um, to un try to unpick and understand the um, East African sesame industry. Sesame is a very valuable crop. Um, produces potentially a really good income and East Africa can produce it uh, in a counter-seasonal way which gives them a real advantage. So um, I went out and worked with the Tanzanian breeder. Um, he had been breeding white sesame for 25 years um, under the belief that white sesame was necessary because that's what you put on burger buns. So we worked with him to unpack the, uh, the value chain for sesame and we discovered that nearly 100% of Tanzania and Mozambique sesame was going to Japan. And in Japan, they put it in a giant machine, crush it and take oil out at the end. They're completely disinterested in the colour. So tragically he'd been working for 25 years to, and successfully managed to make a white seed with the local variety, but the buyer was completely indifferent to that. There's a happy ending to it because it turns out that buyers in rural Tanzania, this has a higher yield, higher yield of oil. So the buyers in rural Tanzania can identify the white seed from the traditional brown seed. So they get a higher price for this, thank goodness. But it is an example of, of how uh, 
you know, a scientist without interdisciplinarity, without proper, proper um, direction, can fix on a plan and just head that way for a very long period of time. Um, a similar story uh, with our colleagues in CIMIT, I was part of uh, a review team um, for, for CIMIT on their, their fantastic work on GMO maize. Um, they've worked for years and years producing really brilliant, resistant, high yielding varieties of maize. Uh, I went to talk to a farmer in southern Mexico and I asked him, How, what do you think of this maize? Is it good? He said, oh, it's fantastic. I put my kids through school. It's absolutely brilliant. So, well, you know, do you eat it? He said, oh, no. It's terrible. I wouldn't eat this rubbish. I eat that one over there. And then he produced a field of all of these weird varieties here and said, oh, these make the best tortillas. So, you know, it does all this and it's really good. So, um, again, uh, and in fairness to the Simic guys, they did know, they did know this and that they were trying to um, to build into their breeding story, new varieties also made good traditional food. Uh, my third kind of disconnect story is about goats. You, you may not realize this, uh, a few people will, but the, um, Namibia is the biggest exporter of goats in Southern Africa. More than a million goats a year go from Namibia. Well, they go from Namibia. So when, uh, when I started out in Namibia, I asked them, do you know where the goats go? There's a million. It's a lot of goats. And they say, no, uh, we don't know. Sorry, Ben. It's just... We know they go somewhere because we've got all the export permits, but we don't know where they go. So we set up a program with, uh, with young economists, young researchers, and we followed trucks um, across southern Africa. And what we discovered um, through this journey was that the goats were all going to Durban. And the reason they were going to Durban is because um, that they were being used by uh, Zulu priests. So if you had a disease, ingrowing toenail, or um, you've got someone pregnant, or you know, you've got some story in your life, you go to your local Zulu priest and you say, oh, please tell me what to do. And he says, give me some money, I'll give you the answer. You give him some money, he sells you a goat, you slaughter the goat, your problem solved. A million goats a year, massive industry. So this goat um, industry is premised on the fact that Zulus require white goats to fix problems. If you have a brown goat, it means you've murdered someone. And apparently the, the South African CID are always very interested if the people are selling brown goats. It means that uh, you should uh, really investigate closely whether there's been a murder here. So the people of Botswana and Zimbabwe who've been trying to sell goats in Namibia had never bothered to find out why their goats didn't sell. It's because they're, they're brown and white and black and like this kind of mixed, mixed variety. Uh, all of the Namibian goats were white, and we were able to reinforce a breeding program that, uh, that increased the uh, chance that farmers would get white goats and therefore get a higher price for them. We also stopped making fat goats, because nobody was interested in a fat goat. <laughs> Why would you want a fat goat when you're just going to kill it and give it back to the, 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 the Zulu priest? So we started selling smaller goats. <laughs> so some of the things I've worked on over the years have been quite challenging uh, to sell. Um, I, I don't know whether anybody's come across this uh, particular product. Are you familiar with the balu from, uh, from the Philippines? Um, it's a half-grown duck. Um, really quite nasty. Really has to be eaten in the dark. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it to do it with your eyes open. But it's a delicacy in that part of, of the world. Um, and we started a, a, a program of getting uh, women into groups, into small businesses, um, to sell uh, these products at, uh, at tourist venues, uh, not to, uh, to Filipino tourists who like this sort of stuff when they've had a few drinks. Um, a, a balut is just the thing. I found myself um, a number of years ago working through different uh, value chains for fisheries products in uh, Bangladesh and uh, uh, southern India and Sri Lanka uh, on the top floor of a five-star uh, hotel at two o'clock in the morning um, trying to interview an ambergris trader uh, ambergris is whale vomit. It's enormously valuable. Uh, it goes, it's a fixative in the um, perfume industry of enormous value, but nobody knows when it's going to turn up. So supply and demand is, is all over the place. For an economist, it makes no sense. You can't really work out what the price is and how it's fixed. And I have to say, the trader, when I eventually managed to corner him, had no idea where the stuff came from or where it went to either. So I got kind of stuck on that. Um, these, these are carl worms. Um, 
I, I spent a very fun two days uh, with a community in northern Namibia um, trying to unpack all of the natural products that might be available to them and might have value, and to value them with a team of young economists. Um, under the premise we were trying to understand what the real value of, of the rural economy was in, in that part of the world. And we worked through all of the plants and the animals, um, and we got onto the birds and the bees. And, and they listed 147 insects that they liked to eat. And of all of these insects, the one they really loved was the kraal worm, which is about so big, um, and is sliced like, um, like black pudding and fried, and uh, I'm told delicious, but um, I didn't taste one. Uh, one of the strangest ones I've ever done. Uh, I, I, I spent some time when, the, um, when Eastern Europe um, opened up. NRI was uh, engaged in the process of trying to um, help Eastern European countries uh, prepare for joining the European Union and, and open up new new markets and take stuff um, out of the shops and stop having people queuing up to get it. So I found myself in the middle of wi middle of winter in in Romania um, uh, with uh, NRI colleagues in a large room full of people with fur coats on. And through the translator, I was asked, Mr. Bennett, please tell us, how do we sell our crap? <laughs> and as you can see, this is, this is crap in Ule Picard. Um, they had on the table a massive pile of crap in sauce to mash. <laughs> and to this day, I, I still don't have an answer to this, uh, to this question. My, well, my only answer, was, I have two answers. Change the name, uh, or maybe the, the back pages of Private Eye. <laughs> But there are some that have fantastic potential that I've worked on and I still think are the products that are to come. So Hoodia is um, a succulent that grows in the Kalahari, um, where the, the local sand people, the bushmen in the Kalahari, who knows how many millennia ago worked out that if you eat it, you don't feel hungry for three days, which is fantastic. So I went through a process, a, a, at that time a very secret process with Unilever over an eight year period trying to build a factory and put Houdia into SlimFast. Uh, sadly, we got stuck, and we got stuck because it turns out that American consumers don't know when to stop eating diet products. <laughs> they will eat SlimFast until they're slim. And those of you that you know understand plant chemistry you probably realise that something in Houdia, a chemical in Houdia, which turns off your desire to eat, is probably toxic if you eat too much of it. So Unilever decided, to, after spending 22 million dollars to drop it. You can still buy it online, and it works really well, so uh, I, I, I would recommend it. Uh, we've been working recently, oh, by the way, the, when we asked the SAN community, and we were negotiating with Unilever, uh, the, um, their chief negotiator told me privately that Hulia also had an aphrodisiac property. And I had to tell him, please keep that one quiet, because we were already struggling with the slimming quality. <laughs> People would be slim and horny. I, <laughs> potential disaster in America. <laughs> Riots, everything else. Kisk Sahidi, um, we've been working on recently, is a fascinating farro food. Um, it, it's a small fermented ball made with wheat and, uh, wheat and sear milk um, that's fermented on the roofs of, of people's houses and has been for who knows how many thousands of years. You heard it here first. It's a fantastic energy drink, tastes great. Um, we're, we're working on a process of, of trying to get it permission to come into the European Union and be sold as a, as a high-end natural energy drink and a farro food. Um, Bambara groundnuts, I don't know whether Claire's here today, because Claire's been working on Bambara with, with, thank you Claire, there you are. Uh, couldn't, couldn't do this without mentioning Bambara, I'm a big Bambara fan. I don't, uh, people probably didn't realise there's more than one groundnut out there. Bambara is grown all over southern Africa, um, tragically it gives you wind. Um, which is its kind of main property. However, if you set aside this minor problem, it tastes great. When you eat it fresh, it tastes like a fresh um, soya bean. And it has a very unique property. It's only, in most countries, it's believed that only women should grow it, and particularly only old women should grow it. And it's the only commodity I've ever come across in all of these years that is just given, parked, if you like, and, and constrained around older women. So it represents a fantastic opportunity to, to bring older women into markets and give them more money. If we can, the, of course the worry is as soon as it becomes valuable, men will rush in and 
we'll, we'll forget about all these nice traditional things and we'll make money out of it. Anyhow, Bambara Ground, I think, has great possibility. If you are Zambian and you get married, you have to have a poloni, a giant pink sausage, um, at your wedding ceremony. If you've not properly married, apparently, uh, unless you have a giant poloni. And it's made with orchids. And I, I've included this because it's one of the few orchid products that's traded in the world, wild orchid products. They make giant sausage with this in, uh, from Luapula uh, in north uh, east uh, Zambia. Uh, and I think there's a real opportunity to turn this from a wild harvest product um, into a cultivated product, which is quite a challenging thing to do for lots of reasons. I'm going to gloss over all of the stuff on international trade. I've done some great stuff on international trade, and some of you may hear me talk about this tomorrow if you're watching me talk again. Um, I've learned a lot of lessons from doing trade negotiation. Um, I've negotiated trade agreements for lots of different countries with lots of young, uh, young economists. Um, and I, I have to say that the, the, the average young graduate African economist is absolutely fantastic. Make them stand on a stage and talk to 300 senior trade negotiators in, in Geneva and they'll talk for two hours once you've got them started. Absolutely fantastic. Very satisfying part of, of the work that I've done. Um, but I want to get on to uh, natural products, uh, natural product value chains and their embedded uh, value. Uh, millet and myrrh. Um, pearl millet looks like, looks like this. Um, I fear this is full of pests, which I've brought back from somewhere. I'm sorry for <laughs> releasing those uh, in the UK. Um, in very arid countries, um, it, gives you, it gives you a yield when everything else fails. So for food security, it's really, really important. And when I got to Namibia, the Namibians were very keen that we try and do something with their pearl millet economy. This is a basket where people <laughs> store their, their pearl millet. Uh, so the problem was there was no commercial pearl millet sector. Nobody bought, or, bought and sold it. They gifted it or they kept it. <coughs> there was a huge likelihood of crop failure because the rain sometimes didn't come for two or three years. Um, traditionally, we had extremely low yields. Um, and people were keeping their supplies for up to six years in these stores. So to try to address these, these many facets and many different problems, what I did in those days was um, to set up a, a national platform um, for pearl millet, to try to address all the problems with all the stakeholders. Um, with a research program, we tried to unpick the markets, we produced new seeds, we worked on post-harvest losses, and uh, Rick, was, Rick was heavily involved in that with the, with the team. Um, we tried to encourage some of the bigger farmers to become surplus farmers so we had sufficient um, to actually make an industry work. It's a chicken and egg problem. You can't have a pearl millet industry if you don't have any surplus. Um, and we had a consumption campaign. All this thing was done with all the stakeholders. It's one of the things that I've learned. You need to have all the stakeholders in the room to make this work. Our consumption campaign was based on some really interesting market research. So we went out and asked people about their uh, their millet. We asked who eats millet and why they eat millet. Nobody had ever done this before. And what we found out is that young people have decided um, that millet actually is the food of the devil. It's what grandmother gives you um, if she's angry. It looks like glue, it tastes like glue, and they'd like to eat pasta and pizza, which is a bit of a problem for the future of pearl millet. So we went to an advertising company and I hired um, a market research company um, and an advertising company to develop an advertising program for Namibia. And I, I, I think it was a really good thing to do. It was a particularly successful. We got the president eating millet, and we got famous people eating millet. We got Frankie Fredericks eating millet. Bless him, he's a very nice man. Um, he will do anything for you, great guy. Um, and we, had, we developed a soap opera. A soap opera in five episodes um, involved um, a guy and a girl, um, girl discovers that the guy really doesn't like traditional food. Girl leaves the guy. Guy goes and talks to his buddy. Buddy says, you're an idiot. Traditional food's great. He starts eating traditional food. Girl finds out about it. Everybody's happy ever after. <laughs> that took about five hours. They're still playing it on Namibian radio today, nearly ten years later. 
to my amazement, very, very popular indeed. And we had lots of other elements associated that with the plan, so um, one or two people here that have actually were in the media at the time might even recognise this giant poster campaign that we had, some in the north and some in the south of the country. We had the Feed the Beat campaign to try and make um, Mahone, Pearl Millet, try and make it cool. Unfortunately, this was the best picture of Pearl Millet that the, <laughs> that the advertising company <laughs> come up with. Well, it didn't look very cool to me, but they said it was cool. Um, and with this campaign came a radio jingle that was played all the time. Not going to Feel free if you want to uh, get on the move. You are the chief for the Fletcher Bruce. We are talking of the Fletcher. Shit. Oh, shit. Uh huh. This is for me. You know that I'm an African. Oh, shit. Uh, don't neglect your boots. We talking of the Fletcher. Good. Yo, eat this, Mahango. <laughs> How cool was that? Massively successful program. So we actually. I'm very proud of the fact that we won a Southern African Social Marketing Award for that, and, and quite rightly too, because it was the first time anyone had tried to do that with a food, uh, food product. Very good stuff. Um, so, I'm getting towards the end now, the bit of my work that I'm in a way most, uh, most proud of um, is this indigenous fruit work uh, in Namibia. And Namibia has now become um, a world leader in developing uh, natural products. I hope you're reading these bits and pieces that I'm putting up, by the way. I'm, I'm not reading them out, because I know you can all read them for, your, for yourselves, particularly the Liverpool and Manchester City fans. So, wild harvested natural products have particular and unique problems, and one of the problems is, is this issue of the tragedy of the commons. Uh, because they're out there in the wild, and they're in forests, and they're an open access area, anybody can go in there and take them away. So you have to mediate this in some way. Otherwise, people go in, they take the seeds, they take the grass, they take in their cows and graze. That's a worry. The cow seems to be affecting the... Uh, <laughs> good that we've got two. Um, and you get to a tipping point if you have an open access result. And the tipping point is when everybody comes in because there's no self-interest in not getting in there and taking everything out. And once you've gone past the tipping result, <laughs> Your cows can't survive. So that's the tragedy of the commons. Um, and a unique aspect of natural products. Natural products have a lot of fantastic associated traditional knowledge, which has value, but extracting that value is really hard. It's dispersed at small scale. It's over an enormous area. Uh, this is the point where most people say it was an area the size of Wales or Belgium, but you know, bigger than that often in Namibia. Huge areas. The markets are highly disaggregated. Um, they have no intellectual property protection, typically. Um, there's no value addition. Raw materials just leaving the country. Um, it's extraordinarily difficult to get these products into markets. Uh, getting a new product into a highly regulated market, um, the hood year from beginning to end, we're talking uh, probably 20 to 30 million dollars to, to overcome all of the different barriers. Very difficult indeed for, 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 um, for a medicine particularly hard. They're highly seasonal, so you don't get steady supply all the time. Um, they can be extremely scarce, which can be a bad thing, can be a good thing, can be really valuable. Um, and they have some weird properties. Uh, what they really have is an association with the people and the place that they come from. And that's really a fantastic, a fantastic plus point of natural products, but a difficult thing to turn into real value. Um, and just as an example, this is Comifera oblanceolata. It sounds like someone that, uh, that plays a flanker for the, for the New Zealand rugby team, but difficult one to say. Um, but it's only present on a couple of hills, in a couple of clumps of it in northern Namibia. So its very scarcity gives it extraordinary value. It's also blue. It gives a blue essential oil. It's the only blue essential oil I've ever come across. So the fact that there's very little of it and it's blue means it might be worth the effort of spending millions of pounds getting it into a, into a new market. It's quite an exciting one. So what was our solution in Namibia? Well, we developed an innovation platform, and sort of thing that you're talking about before. We got all the stakeholders behind our idea. Um, we gave communities ownership of their products, and that ownership is key to them managing the natural resource and not having a tragedy of the commons. Um, we developed a, 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 a policy infrastructure that was supportive 
conservancies, community forests, so people could have ownership of their products. Once you've got all these, you can have community-based natural resource management. Um, from there, you can start to um, build some manufacturing. We, had, uh, we built three factories over the last few years. Um, you can have a stakeholder um, group, Indigenous Plant Task Team, now met 100 times in Namibia over the last 15 years, which is amazing. Um, most other countries don't have that level of organization. Um, you can start to focus on organizing the groups to meet the demand that you have, which is not an easy thing to do. And you can start to use the economics to manage the, um, the wild resource, clever auctions and steward stewardships and, and, and clever economics to change people's behavior. Um, and you can start to build a pipeline of products into different markets for different things. So this is what our pipeline, a bit of what a pipeline looks like. Um, the idea here, you've got a whole series of commodities, it's a bit blurry so don't try and read it, it'll hurt your eyes. A whole series of commodities down, down one side and a whole series of criteria along the other. So you can see where you need to make your investments and switch your investments, overcome research problems and barriers to entry, and move along the pipeline at different speeds. So we've got one line in the middle here that's green all the way along, that one's ready to market. And, and it's important to have a structure that can produce a number of different products. If you put all your eggs in one basket, you're likely to fail. Um, Tom mentioned Devil's Claw. Um, I've got a Devil's Claw seed pod here. Um, that's why it's called Devil's Claw, because it's quite sharp and, and, and bitey. Um, it's fantastic for, uh, for rheumatics and arthritis. It's got known medicinal properties, been used in Europe for a long time. But it's dug out of holes in the Kalahari by very poor local people who have no other source of income. So they dig a big hole and they leave, leave it like this and the stuff doesn't grow back. So we've been working with communities to develop processes to encourage them to be sustainable, to get a higher price for the stuff that does actually grow back, that it's properly maintained. Uh, and these groups here, that's about the size of Wales. Um, these groups here, um, they have soil association accreditation because they fill in their holes and they replant their, their product and they come back next year and they have more. Um, and we went up the scale, we went for quality. So we dried the product better and we got a higher price and we got organic certification for that product. Um, and the stuff you buy in boots um, is, is coming from this nice lady here. It's a great story. To do that, we had to understand how the value chain worked, to bypass the value chain. And I did this piece of research on understanding the Devil's Claw value chain, and it was really complicated, and really dispersed, and really disaggregated. This is the field to factory, that's the factory to processor, that's the processor to retailer. So, a very simple product, but to actually get it turned into a medicine that was put on the shelf in boots, has an enormous number of steps. And the net result of this is that the poor farmer in Namibia gets less than 4% of the retail value of what it is that they're doing when they're digging that hole. Um, and, and that's what uh, our recent work has been addressing, trying to get all of those farmers uh, aggregated around having one price for the product and pushing the value that they get um, up above 3.7% because it's clearly inadequate. Um, Zaminia um, is a very nice oil um, which is traditionally used um, to make your skin smooth. It's got very long uh, Long, fatty acid, long chain fatty acids, so I'm told if you paint it on your face, you look younger. Um, I'm not going to explore that any further because I fear I'm going to get into trouble, but uh, uh, that's, this is a Zaminia tree, and those are the Zaminia seeds. It's quite difficult and sticky and unpleasant to process. So again, we had to, the, here's the size of Belgium, um, we had to work out where the trees were, manage the process of extracting it, build a factory, overcome the regulatory barriers, um, make a value chain, develop a value chain for it, and that's the product that L'Oreal have on the shelf. It's a Zaminia based night, night cream, um, all of which comes through this, this process, sells for a ridiculous amount of money. The, the price of night creams, who knew? I, I've never used a night cream. Turns out you have to spend a lot of money to get a really good night cream, and Zaminia night cream is, is the best. Um, I suppose everybody's heard of Amarula. Uh, from Southern Africa, it's a nice tipple. Sadly, it uses very few marula fruit. Um, a couple of trees probably does the entire annual production of marula. So actually, there are not very many beneficiaries, and that's disappointing. In Namibia, uh, we've been working on the kernel. This is the bit in the middle of the marula fruit. 
It's got a tiny little blob of uh, fatty um, meat in the center. And Namibian women traditionally sit around and tell stories and sing songs and pull this stuff out. Um, over the last uh, couple of decades, we've been developing a process of community groups, mostly women's community groups, that bring this stuff into a central uh, factory, squeeze the oil out of it, and I'm very proud to say L'Oreal, uh, again, good for them, um, we have a long-term relationship with the body shop, and almost every body shop product has got some of this marula in it, because body shop uh, want to meet a certain quantity to, uh, to get their standard for fair trade um, and for community, uh, community beneficiation. Um, an easy way to do it is to stick marula uh, in there. So next time you're in, um, you're in the body shop, have a look at the list of ingredients. They're very, very small, but you'll find, you'll find marula oil in there, which is, which is fantastic. So we've set up a series of groups um, over the years throughout northern uh, Namibia. Most of these groups do two or three different commodities because they need to manage their, their risk in, in some way. We found if they only did one and the price went down or the market disappeared, they were in trouble. Um, and the sales um, over the last four years uh, have now got to uh, nearly a million dollars uh, a year in real terms, which is an impressive amount of money. Um, for uh, nine to ten thousand, mostly women wild harvesters. So it, it's a great story. <coughs> um, we come to Mur, um, and hopefully the uh, exciting and somewhat dangerous part of the, of the evening. So um, Mur, as you know, um, was uh, was present with frankincense and, and gold at the birth of uh, baby uh, the baby Jesus. Um, most of it comes from the Horn of Africa. Uh, and, and when we started out on our myrrh journey, um, the Horn of Africa was in, was in utter chaos, so the, cost of, the price of myrrh was really high. So we identified that the same species, Camifera, was present in northern Namibia, and maybe there was an opportunity to grab a bit of that market space for an incredibly high value product. So we set up a myrrh factory, we found someone to buy the myrrh from us, um, and we started on this process. The other myrrh came back on stream and started to suddenly get cheaper. So we had to think, what the hell are we going to do to keep this factory going? And the way we tried it to add value was to turn it into a tourist experience. And I got some money to um, build a visitor centre on the side of the factory. So the film you're going to see now um, is about, is, is the film that we're showing to international tourists who pay $30. So imagine you're sitting in northern Namibia, you pay $30. You're in this lovely um, traditional Himba hut, built large, um, and uh, we show you this video to introduce you to how sustainable wild harvesting works. are mostly white. A few naughty brown ones there. The 
persuading them to walk away from the camera was quite difficult. Apparently the Himba have no word in their language for blue, is it? Yeah, they're famous for having no word in their language for blue. I don't know why. Never seen, never seen the sea. center of the construction on the side there. These are the stills where, where the essential oil is extracted. <laughs> so, now you get to see the factory um, and hopefully you get to smell the aromas of the fantastic myrrh that's being, uh, um, being burnt rather too excitedly in the smoke about that. Um, we, we experimented with this, um, and it went fine. Uh, didn't do that. I didn't know it could do that. Anyhow, can you smell? In the back, can you, can you smell the moon? 
good, thank you. You get the general idea. It's been a huge uh, success. Um, people pay $30 a time. When they come out, they're desperately keen to buy myrrh. And it's also given me an opportunity to, to, opportunity to stand up in front of all my scientific colleagues in a white coat, something I've never had a chance to do before. Absolutely brilliant. It sounds like pine resin. Sorry? It sounds like pine resin. That's, that's because that's, uh, that's a lot of, the pine oils are a lot of what, uh, what gives you that smell. It's a tree, tree product. It smells like burning pine resin at the moment. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure it'll be fine. Don't, don't, don't panic. It hasn't set the fire alarms off, which is the key thing. So, uh, from all of this massive practice on natural products in, in Namibia, what things have I learned? Well, um, if you want to engage stakeholders, you have to fund it. You have to put your hand in your pocket. You have to encourage people to come together. Um, you need financial flexibility. The Namibian government were very smart. They gave, us, they gave our innovation platform some money and that enabled them to do wise things, um, to, to go and get an IP lawyer when we needed an IP lawyer, for example. You have to do things a step at a time. Often it's one step forward on one of those, um, one of those lines and one step back. As markets open and markets close and new opportunities and new problems arise, you need champions. Um, we had a fantastic uh, champion um, in the perfume sector um, who was very interested in myrrh, but he wanted complete exclusivity. Um, exclusivity sounds exciting, but you have to think about what the other opportunities might open to you. Should we go for it? Shouldn't we go for it? It was a big and difficult challenge for the Namibians. Um, and the one way, is, if you have exclusivity, you can't diversify your markets, you can't sell your stuff to other people. We underestimated the local markets and we set up challenge funds eventually to try and encourage local users of these different oils and natural products to include those ingredients in their shampoos and different bits and pieces. That was massively successful. Didn't cost us very much money, generated a huge amount of new businesses. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I would advise investing in quality early because somebody else will make this stuff cheaper than you pretty quickly once they've worked out there's an interesting market for it and you've opened it up. So if you have the best stuff, you'll probably win out. Um, and I'm afraid it takes a really long time. I've been at this for a very long time. Um, developing the market from Rural took at least 20 years. Um, and, and there's many years of this to come. It's a very long cycle, there's no quick fix. That's the work on natural products as, as as the university gently burns down. Um, I, I want to, uh, from all of these different practices in different areas that I've, I've been working on, um, I, I want to come, with, come to you with a few lessons and a few ideas over the horizon of, of, of how I see the world might be um, in the future in response to all of those challenges at the beginning. Um, I, I, think, I think we'll see a world where women are properly engaged in rural economies. There's a lot of lip service to this at the moment. It has improved in my time, but in some countries that I work in, it's gone backwards. And I find that very disappointing. That's got to change. Um, I think in the future we will breed new crops uh, for markets. It will become the norm. We won't have another sesame story. Um, agricultural policies need to balance competition with social and environmental protection. It's tricky, nuanced thing to do, but I think we're getting better at understanding it and how to do it. Um, new technologies will slash transaction costs. Um, roads will open, it will become cheaper to talk to people on the phone. Um, I'd like to see a world with no post-harvest losses, or at least to minimize the post-harvest losses that we have and stop wasting all of that food and energy. Um, I think new technologies will revolutionize uh, quality management and market regulation. Um, it'll be cheaper to meet a standard than it was. Um, I think there will be less globalization. I've done a lot of work in international trade. I think there'll be less globalization and more localization. I think local markets, as cities become bigger and towns become cities and countries become developed, I think develop, uh, exploiting local markets will suddenly become much more interesting. Um, I, I, I fear that new types of poverty will emerge and one of those, for example, will be food safety poverty. Um, we take for granted the fact that we hope the stuff we buy from Tesco's is safe. Um, I fear that we'll become two levels of the world's economy. One's where the food is, is, is completely safe and, and the other where, it, where the food is just what it is. Uh, and we'll have a two-level a two economy. So there will be new types of poverty that we haven't, we haven't really discovered yet. And I think inevitably value chains will become more complicated as more people become engaged with them through the new technologies uh, than, than they are now. 
which is good news um, because it will probably give me a livelihood for many years to come. Um, I have to show this picture uh, because my uh, wife bought it for me for Valentine's Day, which uh, says something about my relationship with macaques rather than my relationship with, uh, with my wife. Um, I, I think even the monkeys will be using apps, or the apes will be using apps in, in, in the future. I think, um, I think that's the world that we're, we're, we're at the realm that we're entering into now. So uh, just to wrap things up, and you're probably wondering why, um, why Manchester United is involved in this, I have to finish by saying something about Manchester United. So what lessons do we have from Manchester United um, that I can apply to my practice in, in agricultural markets in developing countries? Well, you, clear, you need a clear strategic vision and measurable targets to have a successful football team. You need that to have a successful Natural Resources Institute. Um, and uh, you can argue with the numbers, but there they are. I know they've changed recently, but um, um, we had a target, we met those targets. You need uh, some brand recognition. Um, there's uh, not a lot of brand recognition for cassava around the world, but everybody recognizes that. Um, and uh, maybe there's some connection between this and that that we could, we could make. Um, you need fantastic leadership. You need, uh, I, I'm sorry, you need a loud Scotsman to shout at you when things are going wrong. Um, and United had that. Uh, you need star players. Uh, my uh, best chum argued with me vehemently a couple of weeks ago that this wasn't the appropriate star player to put into this presentation. Um, Anyhow, he's the one that I chose. Uh, you need style and luck. We all need style and luck. And I unashamedly share with you my favorite Manchester United goal. Oh. How to create space and then leap past a couple of defenders. McLaren, here's Cantona! It's the best bit. <laughs> <laughs> best celebration ever. And again. It's worth enjoying the second time. Thank you. That's so good. Right. I hope you enjoyed that. I'm sorry for the uh, Liverpool and Manchester City fans in the, in the audience. Um, this is the point of the evening where um, I have to say a few thank yous. Um, most of the work that I've been talking about for the last uh, probably an hour and a half, I'm sure I've overrun. Um, most of the work. A lot, well, a lot of it wasn't done by me, it was done by, uh, by colleagues uh, and, and, and friends and people that I've worked with uh, in, in the developing, developing world. And this is the reason why they don't allow questions after these talks, because this is the point where people put their hand up and say, wait a minute, Ben, you didn't do that, I did. So I recognize all of that fantastic work that, uh, that everybody did um, at NRI, and, and also recognize some of the wonderful counterparts I've had over the years, some sadly have of past uh, HIV AIDS decimated many of my colleagues in Southern Africa while I was, I was working there. But I've been blessed with fantastic people to work with. And it's been some of the best things, the best times in my life have been embedded in, in, in ministries in developing countries and, and, and working to solve problems uh, with colleagues and counterparts. Uh, I've had some fantastic uh, mentors and managers. Um, all the way through my career, uh, my various line managers, some, some here, some, some not here. See John, John and, uh, and Andrew, uh, thank you for your efforts and thank you for putting up with my bad jokes for many years and advising me to stop doing it. <laughs> Hasn't worked, I'm afraid. Um, to do all this travel and all this work, uh, you, um, you need friends, you need to be grounded in some way. Um, I've had friends that have stayed with me despite all of this, uh, all of this travel and relocation. Um, I, I'm sad today that my parents can't be uh, here to share this uh, with me, but my brother's, uh, and, uh, my brother's wife's here, and, uh, and it's fantastic you managed to, uh, to get here and you didn't sail past to Dover, which was one problem um, earlier on. Um, and finally, um, my family have been with me on this journey all the time. They've traveled with me all over the world. They've been stationed with me in the Philippines uh, and in, in Namibia, uh, and without their support and, uh, and understanding, and particularly without my wife having had to listen to this lecture for three times. She's had enough now. Um, please sympathize with her uh, over a cocktail uh, later. Uh, thank you for all that, that love and support over, over many years. 
And I'll leave you, leave you with this image. If you remember at the beginning, we had an image of me in Nigeria, maybe 25 years ago. I was there three weeks ago. I went into a rice mill, and I, I rather like to think, this wasn't very far from Minna, uh, wasn't very far from where I live. I like to think that maybe he's the son of one of those footballers that I worked with, and perhaps my enthusiasm for Manchester United rubbed up on him. Who knows? Anyhow, thank you for listening to me.